Everyone has to slip up sometime, right? In a career of smash hit after smash hit, there's bound to be a relative flop. When We Were Orphans is seen as that book, a book that when it came out, audiences reacted with sure and fine and this is certainly a book by Kazuo Ishiguro. <laughs> the man himself described it as not my best book, which is quite funny. It's interesting to think about why it got such a tepid response and how far that was deserved. Is When We Were Orphans Unfairly Maligned? I'm Eddie, we're going through a book of Kazuo Ishiguro's every month, catch up, time waits for no one, especially not the raters of Ishiguro's stories, am I right? Ayo. When We Were Orphans is the story of Christopher Banks, a young Englishman ambitious to become the world's greatest detective. He was born and raised in the Shanghai International Settlement in the 1900s, a cordon off section of a city in which British and American citizens lived outside of Chinese jurisdiction. He reflects back on his childhood there, growing up with his Japanese neighbour, Akira. Christopher's father worked for a business involved in the opium trade, whereas Christopher's mother was a passionate anti-opium campaigner. Their relationship wasn't the greatest. Christopher describes his father as a weak-willed man. This in contrast with Uncle Philip, a frequent house guest that little Chris sees as kind of his, his guide to true Englishness. Eventually, one day, his father vanishes. Shanghai's finest detectives ably search for him, but are unable to find even a trace of the man. Uh, Christopher says he was relatively unbothered about this disappearance at the time. His friend Acura starts to play a game with him involving uh, searching for his father and eventually beating up the people that captured him. They end up playing this game pretty much every day, and this is where his passion for being a detective is born. One day during this time, Christopher's mother Diana is seen having an argument with a Chinese man in which she strikes him. Christopher thinks little of it. Eventually, Eventually, however, Uncle Philip takes him on a trip into town one day and then lets him know that he didn't want him to get hurt. Unsurprisingly, when he returns to the house, his mother is also gone. Back in the more recent present, Christopher, orphaned, title, is entering into society having gone to a fancy boys' school funded by his wealthy aunt. He's invited to a networking event by an old pal and meets a socialite called Sarah Hemmings, who he's immediately struck by. Over the years, his renown grows literally as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> he has on and off interactions with Sarah, including one very adorable one where he goes up to her, introduces himself, and just kind of skulls away afterwards. <laughs> she eventually ends up marrying Sir Cecil, a much older businessman and diplomat, and she informs Chris that she's heading to Shanghai. This awakened something inside of Christopher. So, in 1937, yep, 1937, he heads off to Shanghai to complete his lifelong mission of tracking down his parents. Let, let's ignore the fact that he's, you know, adopted an orphan Jennifer in this time. He certainly does. <laughs> On arrival in China, he's very pleased to find that people have kind of been waiting for him to come and sort everything out. A very kind, well-meaning civil servant called Grayson repeatedly asks him how he wants the reception ceremony for when his parents are finally found uh, to play out. Worth pointing out in case you don't know that Shanghai 1937 is very much being invaded by a Japanese army. <laughs> he realises that the Chinese man that he saw his mother slap all those years ago is a warlord named Wang Ku. He also investigates a man known as the Yellow Snake. Christopher tracks down his childhood hero, Inspector Kung, who was uh, hunting down his parents initially. He finds that he's now a drunkard, but he's still able to direct him to the house where his parents are potentially being held. Bearing in mind that this was 20 years ago this happened, you know? <laughs> However, in the meantime, it becomes very clear that Sarah is not happy in her marriage to Cecil. Indeed, she asks Christopher to run away with her, pointing out that they've both been bound by their past and it's time for them both to let go together. He? surprising himself, agrees. At the last minute though, he inevitably backs out. He gets his driver to take him towards the house, what he doesn't uh, consider is the fact that it's now an active war zone. He nevertheless pushes through this area of Shanghai he's never been to before. Remarkably, he finds his old childhood friend Akira. Oh, this is not a spoiler for review. Just thought I'd point that out there. The two reminisce as Akira guides him to the house. His parents aren't there. There are some bodies in the room and he's very reassured that they are not his parents. Uh, things finally start to click into place for Christopher when the Japanese take him home. He's finally brought face to face with the yellow snake. Grayson, the civil servant, arranges it. Turns out, actually a spy. What? In the Ishiguro switchiguro of the book, it turns out the yellow snake is actually Uncle Philip. He unloads some cold, hard truths. His father did not get kidnapped. He ran away with his mistress. His mother was indeed taken by the warlord after insulting him and was made to be a concubine for him. And most shockingly, he never had a wealthy aunt. The money that he'd been using his entire life was actually directly from the warlord as compensation for taking his mother. Christopher leaves Shanghai 
unable to complete his mission of saving it. He eventually settles down in England, starting a new life with his ward, Jennifer. So, a lot to unpack here. Those familiar with Ishiguro's work know all his narrators have a tricky relationship with the past. Banks, however, is arguably the most delusional of them all. He isn't simply selectively retelling the past, though there is a lot of that, but he also seems to see the world in a different way to everyone else around it. Firstly, Banks is so confident that he's gonna find his parents in the house in Shanghai. Bless his little heart. So thoroughly convinced is he that he'll just walk straight up into a war zone. This despite literal decades passing. His life is so firmly set on this, this course that he's had in his mind since his childhood that he'll just kind of push out anything that doesn't fit in that narrative. His parents himself have additional prominence in his eyes. His mother is said to be a, a very important anti-opium campaigner, but he isn't able to find any record of her when looking into that kind of campaign. This tendency to fix on his parents started when he was very young. He seems to think he was fairly discreet in his ambition to be a detective, yet some of his friends buy him a magnifying glass as a kind of a joke to tease him. And he's a bit like, ha ha, isn't that funny? Gosh, who could want to be a detective? Not me. You're not fooling anyone, bud. The solution that he thinks he can save the world is the most troubling of all. He basically talks as if his cases are straightforwardly the solution to the world's problems. He's not the only one with this delusion, let's be real. So Cecil also seems to think that he can just kind of turn up in Shanghai and fix everything. Worth pointing out that this can obviously be read as a post-colonial critique of kind of the, the heroic English detective. The idea that he could swing back to Shanghai, save his parents, and therefore save everyone is laughable. He actually takes Chinese soldiers away from their posts in order to search for his parents while there is a conflict going on. Moira, he's a bit too happy to find out that the corpses aren't his parents, but just random Chinese citizens. And worst of all, he ditches Acura, like straight away. So I know I've read some reviews which are like, this book beggars belief. How could he find his old mate in the middle of a war zone? He didn't? He, he didn't though. He didn't actually, like he didn't find him though, did he? Doesn't it seem a bit more likely that it's just a soldier that he rescued that starts parroting things back to the delusional Englishman that he wants to hear? Well, nice guy, nice guy, don't get me wrong, he helped him find the house, but it's clearly not his mate. He also seems very willing to evict a full-on Chinese family that was now inhabiting what used to be his house. Like, sure, he has that good old English awkwardness, like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry this is happening. I never saw this coming, but I, you know, I'll take it. I'll take it. Give it. The irony of his entire enterprise, indeed his entire life is funded by a Chinese warlord is, yeah. He wasn't a self-made genius. Everything that he did was funded by exploitation from overseas. Where have I heard that from before? A lot of critics have raised the fact that this is not a very good detective novel. And I kind of agree with that. I think if you come to the story with the idea that it's gonna be a detective novel, you're gonna come away disappointed. Indeed, there is a disconnect between the world of detectives that he presents during the story and the actual world. When he tells one person at a networking event that he intends to be a detective, the response is basically, have you considered looking into working in museums? <laughs> the cases we do see, such as the one with Charles Emery, mostly happen off screen. The sad thing is he's actually quite talented at this. For example, he knows that Philip is a yellow snake before he meets him. He's just kind of locked that away in his head as a do not admit that you know this file. One last important theme is orphanhood. As we've seen, Christopher is quite clearly stuck in the past to a great extent. He wasn't only orphaned in a literal sense, though his mother may actually still be alive, but he was also orphaned in a metaphorical sense. He lost his homeland, the international settlement where he was born and raised and forcibly taken out of. Ishiguro has stated that for him, orphanhood is a metaphor for coming out of that bubble in an unprotected way. That most people have their hands held when the illusion of childhood is shattered, but Christopher very much does not. The we in this title could also be seen to include Sarah, Diana, his mother, and also the entire population of Shanghai. They're all orphans. The end of the novel haven't come a long way, but it's still very firmly stuck in the past. And now what he goes over is his inability to live a happy life with Sarah and reading again and again through his old cases in the newspaper. In the end, I have to agree with Ishiguro, this is not his best book. That doesn't mean it's not a very good book, however. As long as you read it as a character study of a man trapped in his own past, rather than a stereotypical detective novel. And it really does require reading the whole book, as the first section does sometimes drag a little bit, in my opinion. In any case, a lot of value in this text. Would recommend reading. That's it for today. Next month, we're going to be looking at Never Let Me Go, one of Ishiguro's masterpieces. Uh, feel free to stick around, subscribe, or whatever. I'll be here. Let me know in the comments what you think about When We Were Orphans. Is it his worst work? Should it be uh, critically re-examined? What are your thoughts? All right, bye.